uh, well, let's just do that. Let's just, mm. let's just bring her in right this second. And that is Cindy Crosby. Hi, Cindy. Hi, how you doing this morning? Hey, good morning, Mike. Hi, Peggy. Good morning. Uh, my first question about Cindy is how come I didn't know about you until uh, a couple of months ago? That's what I, I don't understand. Um, that's just weird because uh, everybody who finds out that you're, you're going to be on the show is like, wow, she's great. You sh oh, it's going to be such a good show. And uh, uh, Cindy is an author and a lecturer and um, uh, a naturalist. Um, y y you do prairie it all. Prairie steward. Prairie steward. Um, has Photographer, artist, writer. Co contributed to more than 20 books. Uh, including Baker. Candlestick maker. Um, <laughs> no, she bakes. You should see her Facebook page. Really, seriously. Really? Really? Yeah. Too much baking. Too much baking right yeah. now, Peggy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, the author of this book, this is one of the books we're talking about this morning. And, the uh, author of this book. And, the auth and, and involved in this book as well. So, um, and many and, oh, more. <clears throat> and I should mention... The names of those books for those people listening on the podcast, Chasing Dragonflies, A Natural, Cultural, and Personal History, uh, The Tall Grass Prairie, An Introduction, and Tall Grass Conversations, In Search of the Prairie Spirit, that's done with Thomas Dean. Um, and wow. And I, and I have to say something at the get-go, um, Cindy. You uh, write like an angel. You are just so good. It is so easy. If folks, this, okay, we're talking holiday. Pick up a copy of this book, Chasing Dragonflies. Go to uh, cindycrosby.com um, and, uh, and get yourself a copy and you won't be able to put it down. Uh, and you're going to say, what? Dragonflies? What are you, what are you talking about? Well, uh, I'm talking about a woman who's a, an excellent writer and who has a sense of perspective uh, of, of, about the world and the world we live in um, and, and the role that insects play in it and specifically odinates because that's what we call dragonflies and damselflies and may, a lot of you may, may, maybe have never heard that word um, and it has nothing to do with Thor uh, uh, or Norse gods <laughs> you get it Cindy thank you thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks. It's like somebody gets my humor. Uh, <laughs> and and it's, uh, we, we were going through the long list of what Cindy does. Uh, Kathy Street just posted as well. Cindy does an amazing blog every Tuesday that you can get in your inbox or get online. Yeah, put the link to that. Uh, uh, well, you've got Cindy Crosby up, uh, dot com up yeah. there already. And, and you if you go there right on the home page, you can connect to uh, Cindy's uh, blog post, uh, which is, is also really, really wonderful. Um, and so today, we're not going to talk just about dragonflies. Uh, we're going to talk about going out into the wild and uh, into a natural area and, 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 and what that means uh, for one's sanity in, uh, in a world where uh, yeah. we're still in a, a Chicago winter. <laughs> well, in a pandemic. Chicago winter, and um, and given that uh, there's all kinds of news uh, coming out, uh, Peggy and I were just talking last night about um, uh, the headline uh, and the story that uh, Patty Wetley has yeah. writ written. Can I read the headline here? Go ahead. Rockford Airport sues to dismiss lawsuit halting destruction of Belbow Prairie. It's so sad, and um, the Rockford Airport people um, are playing hardball. Um, they're, they've decided that um, we don't care, basically, is sort of their, uh, their attitude. We don't care. We do not care that there's a remnant prairie there. We do not care that there's biology that you might not see anywhere else in the state, perhaps anywhere else in the Midwest. We don't care. We're going to take our bulldozers and we're going to do whatever the, we want to do. And you can't stop us. And if you try fact, to stop, we might do more. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is, this is not new. 
their attitude. This has been their attitude from the get go. Yeah. We've covered this on this show. Um, and, um, I, I know we're getting into it right now, but it's, 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 it's important. Um, and Cindy, I'm sure you have a few words, uh, uh, about yeah. this i mean what what does this have you been to bell bowl prairie i have been outside the fence just since it started but i'll tell you um it's hard to get people excited about the words dry gravel hill prairie right it's not like the rocky mountains it's not like uh, niagara falls where you go and you go wow look at that but in fact um joni mitchell for those of you old rockers like me saying um, you don't know what you got till it's gone and folks we are the prairie state we are illinois the prairie state and we have almost nothing of our original prairie left and you might say well hey the forest preserve has all these big prairies you know but those are planted prairies and they're great and they're great for pollinators they're great for us who are learning about prairie, but they are not remnant prairie. And it's estimated we only have, I think the Illinois um, History Survey said we only have a little over 2,000 acres of original high quality prairie remnant. So prairie that has never been plowed. Um, this is the prairie that was here thousands of years ago. Uh, and boy, when it's gone, it's gone. You don't have it anymore. And right. all the information is, is gone. So, you know, I could get really worked up about this. I have been really worked up about mm -hmm. this, Mike and Peggy, but it's because, um, you know, it does it matter. It does. And why does it matter? Because um, Aldo Leopold talked about saving all the parts. You know, we got to save all the parts of nature. Because down the road, we, we may need those parts for people. And it's unfortunate that this really special place is in the middle of an airport, but the airport's been proud of it in the past, um, you know, and it, 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 is, it is sad and it makes me angry. And I'm grateful for all the folks like you and Peggy and so many people that are working hard for Belleville Prairie. I'm learning a lot from them. I don't consider myself a big activist, but you cannot help but speak mm -hmm. out if you love Illinois and you love our historical landscape. Yeah, and if you want more information, you should go to savebellbowlprairie.org. They have uh, all the information. I'll put it up in a moment. Yeah, um, and so that 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 is discouraging yeah. uh, to see and that, then, but not well, surprising discouraging but not surprising at all um so uh um, if i could bridge into cindy's book just a little bit we're going to because, that's that's the whole I, point <laughs> yeah but i i think part of the like you said people don't go oh it's niagara falls it's whatever I, I'm, there's a quote out of the back of your book pay attention be astonished tell about it and even if it isn't niagara falls people get excited people don't realize it's there till someone who's passionate like you tell someone else. And I think that's kind of what's been happening with Bell Bowl too. Yeah. yeah. One, of, one of the reasons I, I wrote um, the tall grass prairie and introduction is exactly for those people who, you know, maybe have lived in Illinois all their lives. I've been here 23 years. When I came here, I had no idea what a prairie was, except when I was a kid and we drove through it on our way to the Rocky Mountains. And I was like, wow, will this boring landscape never end, you know? <laughs> um, you know? Prairie is really about a relationship. It's about taking time to learn um, the nuance of a landscape. And um, the, the tall grass prairie and introduction, my hope was to reach people who looked around at a prairie and just said, you know, I don't really get this. What is this? Um, and you know, there's no jargon, there's no technical, I mean, it's really a beginner's guide. And mm -hmm. I, um, I was a beginner when I came to Prairie 23 years ago, and I'm still learning from it every time I go out on a hike. There's always something new to see, always a lot of stuff I don't know, especially in the winter, and I get to go home and find out about, and a lot of really wonderful people in Illinois 
who um, mentor us and who have dedicated their lives to helping us know about this important landscape. And we're, that's just part of what we're talking about this morning. Um, you're welcome to talk about tall grass prairies uh, anytime uh, you want. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, chasing dragonflies because um, the book is very personal. It's not, uh, as you were explaining to our friend Mac Austin, uh, she's a master naturalist. She's going to be with us in the second half hour. Um, uh, it is not a guide. It's not a field guide. Uh, it's it's more your observations, and there's a lot of good information, and and it, it you're going to learn about dragonflies, um, in a very um, uh, not painful way. It you know you don't have to <laughs> slog through um, uh, descriptions. It's 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 your yeah. impressions, but you have the information there so people understand what this insect is and 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 yeah. why it might be important. And I just want to mention it also has beautiful illustrations by Peggy McNamara, who we had on the show about three or four years ago from the Field Museum, an illustrator. Right. Was she, do you remember which book it was? Was it? A, uh, it was a, with birds. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, yeah. Okay. So she gets a, she gets a ding there. Um, I want to show you a, a picture. I, I, I found this last night. Uh, I did, I did not have this here. I didn't know I had it, still had it. Uh, and I found this, and this is a photo I took in my yard about 15 years ago, all right? Um, oh, beautiful. And I couldn't believe this. This was on, as you can see, it's on a clematis, um, and it's a dragonfly, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is the most incredible insect I have ever seen. And then I found out, it's actually very common, and I was mm -hmm. kind of disappointed. I went, but it's "What? Still beautiful? <laughs> it can't be that common. How could something that beautiful be that common?" Uh, would you like to tell us what we're looking at, Cindy? Sure. Well, you know the problem with common names. This is the common green darner uh, in X Junius, and you know when you hear the word "common green darner," it's like, "Ah, oh, gee, I thought it was something <laughs> special." But this is one of the most special dragonflies in Illinois. And I love it for a couple of reasons, Mike and Peggy. One is, I mean, look at that. And is they're, that they're not, big. They're big. Yes, they're, they're not little ones. Yeah, it's it, it's uh, it, that was the thing. It, it was huge enough for me to see. And then it perched uh, as if posing for this photo. Um, and it looks like it's got a third eye at the top of it, its head, like it's uh, some sort of mystical creature. <laughs> it is a mystical creature. Yes. It, um, it's amazing um, to think of the common green darner because it's one of our migratory dragonflies in Illinois. And a lot of folks don't know that we have several species of dragonflies that are going to migrate in the fall usually in large swarms, hundreds and hundreds of dragonflies moving together uh, down the shoreline of Lake Michigan, across the prairies. Um, I see the big swarms. I see them crossing, you know, the interstate sometimes. It's super cool. They show up on radar when you see the birding radar. And uh, they are headed south. And, you know, we know a lot about monarch butterflies and their migration because of citizen scientists. Oh, I'm so glad you're putting the video up. This is from the Schulenberg Prairie at the Morton Arboretum, and this is in late August of one year. You can see there are hundreds. These are almost all green garners, and hundreds of them um, gathering in a big swarm, moving uh, south, and migration is one of those big mysteries that we still don't know a lot about. So that's um, that's one of the things that fascinates me about dragonflies is there's a lot we don't know. It's kind of where the yeah. monarch butterfly was 50 years ago, you know, where citizen scientists uh, like myself and uh, my dragonfly monitors and uh, Mac, who's coming on in a little bit, that's what we do uh, because we don't know and we want to know more. Yeah, I first uh, learned about this. We learned about this on our show when we had Doug Tarrin mm -hmm. on, uh, oh, fr from the Chicago yeah. Academy of Sciences and uh, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And he said that. He said, you know, the, uh, uh, dragonflies, some dragonflies um, migrate 
but we don't know where they end up. We've we've never discovered that, and uh, we, that's pretty amazing considering they're probably, although I, I don't know if we know this for sure, you know, because the the one generation of monarchs can live several months, so they can make the the journey and 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 procreate and uh, and start another generation. But dragonflies have very short lives, don't they? Very short. Their lives are mostly lived under the water, which is why I love to think about them in the winter time. So right now, when you walk by a pond or a lake or a stream, I mean, it's full of dragonflies and damselflies, uh, but they are under the surface of the water in a completely different form. Mm -hmm. And they can live there for up to, um, in some parts of the world, up to eight years in what's called the nymph stage. So... Super cool. And Doug Taran actually coordinates all the data for Illinois uh, mm -hmm. Dragonfly Monitors. And uh, he's, he's a fabulous person. I'm so glad. Speaking of the nymph stage, that's what, it, that's what it looks like. Okay. And um, as you describe in your book, Chasing Dragonflies, they're ferocious. You don't think, you think of a, a dragonfly as ethereal in some ways, and some of them really are, uh, but they're tough. But in the nymph stage, they're really um, uh, remarkably ferocious, aren't they? Yeah. Well, if you look back in history, a uh, favorite emblem of the um, samurai uh, on their helmets, their war helmets, was the dragonfly. Uh, they called it Kachimushi, the victorious insect, because it's such a ferocious predator in the air. But like you said, um, Mike, it's got nothing on this nymph stage where um, they are the terror of every waterway that they live in. They have a, a hinged jaw that can shoot out and capture um, anything from small fish to, you know, anything aquatic that's floating around in the water that they think looks good for dinner to eating other dragonfly nymphs and damselfly nymphs. Um, plus, uh, they, they're just so cool at this stage because um, they are, well, let's see how I can say it. Uh, they propel themselves around by blowing air out of their butt, we will say. <laughs> and, 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 and if you want to ever um, interest kids in dragonflies, this is a great entree <laughs> story because they're like, they do what? You know, and so they're just shooting around, you know, on the bottom of the, the no pun intended, on the bottom of these streams and um, this, you know, being propelled and shooting out this jaw to catch um, things to eat. It's just, it's just really amazing. And all this is going on, you know, and we don't even really see it. And as you mentioned in the, and I love that part, the idea of propelling themselves by shooting water out of their butts. Um, that is worth the price of admission right there. Okay. Um, but you mentioned that some of them, um, you know, you talk about the, how long they live as adults. It's maybe a month is what, is what you say. Um, and yeah. if, if they're not eaten by a frog or a bird or something else out there or another dragonfly, um, but, um, uh, in the nymph stage, some of them can survive for what, seven years? Yeah, quite a long time, um, especially in different regions of the world. So again, that's, that's an area that's being studied because, um, you know, it's different for every species. Uh, some, uh, you know, come, yeah, it's just, there's a lot of variety, a lot of diversity, and it's one of the things that fascinates me so much about dragonflies is there's always this cool stuff that we're learning about them. Like yeah, the dragonfly is still kind of a mysterious insect, and, um, you know, the more we learn, the more there is to know. Oh, this is, yeah, I'm so glad you have the ebony jewel wings. These are, these are some of my favorite drag, or damselflies. These are, these are actually damselflies. So dragonflies and damselflies are kind of kissing cousins. And they're making the heart or the wheel. They're, they're, the making, wheel. they're making whoopee is what they're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, we always call it making the heart. But um, these are really interesting damselfly. Uh, Marla Garrison, um, who wrote field guides to damselflies of the Chicago region um, or the Chicago area, and she talks about the courtship 
that this species has. So the male is the one um, on the right, and then the female has the little, looks like whiteout on her wings, if you remember whiteout. And they, um, the male has like stroked those little hairs you see on her legs. Uh, so she didn't shave her legs for this. And, <laughs> and that's, that's because, um, you know, that's part of their courtship ritual, uh, Marla taught me. And she also told me that um, the male then will like fly up and down the stream kind of saying like, look, isn't this a great place for you to lay your eggs? And then if she agrees, um, he grabs her. You can see how he's kind of got her, we'll call it the neck. It's really behind the eyes there. He's grabbed her, and if she's receptive, she curls her abdomen right up there until it touches right between segment two and three. And this this is really strange. I mean, this is really unusual in the natural world to have a reproductive strategy where you know they're connected in two places. These are spring water dancers, and this is from the Chusa grasslands, where I'm also a volunteer out by Dixon, Illinois. And you may have heard of um, Nuchusa because they have a herd of about 125 bison, 4,000 acres of um, prairie woodland and other great natural areas and um, some remnant prairie. We were talking about that original prairie in, talk in um, a little earlier. So, um, Spring water dancers are something that are, you know, I didn't know what they were the first time I saw them. Because look how blue the male is. Can you? See? I mean, wow, it's just this really bright blue. And then the female, kind of like in the birding world, sometimes the females um, are a different color. Sometimes they're the same color and look the same. But um, another thing um, you might notice is that kind of Mardi Gras mask in the middle of the eyes. Um, Marla Garrison calls that the Mardi Gras mask, and I love that term. <laughs> That's one of the ways you can ID it. And it is a little bit like Mardi Gras, right? You know, just all, all this yeah. display everywhere. If you go to a um, creek in the summer or a pond or a lake, you're going to see this. You're going to see this wheel. And there's the heart again, the, the heart shape. There's the heart again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they can stay in this position, um, you know, for like, depending on the species, up to an hour or even a little longer. And they can wow. fly around the little hearts flying around so it's 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 fascinating stuff and you can spend a whole day in the summer just sitting by a creek and just seeing what happens uh, and, uh, we we need to break quickly here but um uh let me ask you one quick question because i'll forget to ask it later you talk about uh seeing dragonflies in the prairie uh but also by water can't do do they they have to have a water source nearby i would assume they do, but you will see them in your backyard, even if you don't have a water source. You will see them, I think, up to, you know, maybe three miles away from the water source. It's when they um, are ready to lay eggs and reproduce, um, then they have to have that water source. Yeah. Okay. All right. We need to take a break. When we come back, we're going to have our friend Mac Austin join us as well because she's also an Odinate chaser. Um, again, no relation to Norse mythology all right it's the mike novak show with peggy malecki that's cindy crosby go to cindycrosby.com to uh, get more information and see about her books and and her, uh, her wonderful writing uh, we'll be right back and we hope you're part of the conversation um as you can see our friend uh, mac austin is here she is a uh, the senior amateur nature correspondent for the mike novak show with peggy malecki um and uh, we say that because she's out there in nature as well. She's actually a master naturalist, um, a, a longtime friend, um, and um, has been taking a lot of photos that we've been posting on the Instagram um, page, uh, and, um, and which is actually kind of where we um, got to know you, Cindy. Uh, let's hope, uh, is your mic on, Cindy? Uh, are you uh, there? I believe so. Hey. Yeah, yeah, you're there. I don't can, know can why. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay. Well, I I literally just left VMix and came back. Wow. <laughs> well, that okay. explains why I've been trying to ask questions for the last 10 minutes. and. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. Obviously, uh, we, we no. lost your audio there. So. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask Cindy 
before we start chatting with Mac for our viewers, real quick, what's the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly? What a great question. And, you know, it's probably the most common question I get when I give programs or teach classes on dragonflies. But um, just a couple of quick tips if you're trying to tell them apart, and Mac probably knows all this as well. Um, it, dragonflies have eyes that touch or almost touch. Uh, damselflies have eyes like a shark. So they're like set on the side of the head. And there are some exceptions because it's science, right? There's an exception to everything, <laughs> but that's a pretty good guide. And then if you see something that looks like a dragonfly or damselfly, and the wings are, you got to see, I got to use my arms. Wings are out like an airplane. That's a dragonfly. Wings folded like behind. Oh, beautiful. Yes, I love that. Or um, here we go on my mug. <laughs> uh, wings behind, kind of like a yoga position and folded together. That would be a damselfly. And like, um, the dam photos Mike was showing where the wings were back. Yes, so the spring water dancers and the ebony jewel wings, both damselflies. And then, um, Something to keep in mind too, I mean, a lot of dragonflies, so dragonfly looks like an airplane, right? Look at that chunky abdomen. So dragonflies and damselflies both have um, segments there in uh, one to 10, so 10 segments. And the dragonfly's abdomen, and that's the part a lot of people call a tail, is going to be a little chunkier than a damselfly. Damselflies tend to uh, have abdomens that are very thin and um, and look more, we'll say, like a needle, uh, very skinny. So, And there's a lot of lookalikes too. People are send me pictures a lot of times and they'll say, is this a dragonfly or what kind is it? And you know, it's another insect altogether. But you can usually tell by that segmented abdomen um, whether it is an odinate. All right. We've learned a lot about that. And I just got a, uh, a text from our friend, uh, Kaida Mohammed, um, who is uh, uh, doing some beekeeping on the south side of Chicago. And happy holidays to you, Kaida. Um, and she says, uh, dragonflies love queen bees. If the queen doesn't return from a mating flight, she may have been eaten by a bird or dragonfly. Are you familiar with that, Cindy? No. So, you know, and one of the horrifying things uh, for garden clubs that I talk to is when they they ask if dragonflies and damselflies are pollinators. And I, ha I always say, no, they are not pollinators. In fact, they are probably eating your pollinators. Yikes. And They're oh, anti-pollinators. <laughs> you know, it's critical to remember they are an important, Important dragonflies and damselflies are also eating mosquitoes and lots and lots of mosquitoes and mosquito larvae. And boy, I hate mosquitoes. I, and mosquitoes are pollinators, but we're not planting mosquito way stations like the monarch way stations yeah. to try to. <laughs> so, and, you know, just, and right now, pollinator is a very, um, pollinators have great publicity um they have great press agents yep. and pollinators are critical to our environment but they are not the be-all end-all no pun intended again with the be-all well but, but yeah every every we, insect has got a place here and they're all performing different roles and even just the, the idea the idea that a dragonfly is food for birds is is important and food for other um animals um, yeah, you're right. You can't say we have to exclude everything that's not a pollinator. That's, that's, that's not practical. That's, that's crazy. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the real world is a lot tougher than you think. Oh yeah. Look at wasps. Wasps are actually excellent pollinators, but it's hard to get people excited. Heather Holmes done a great job getting people excited about them. But I mean, there's all these insects that play critical roles in our natural areas. And um, what I love about the focus on pollinators is people are interested in insects. And so from that, you hope the natural outflow or ripple effect is going to be understanding um, all these non-pollinator insects that still have important roles to play. 
So mm-hmm. let's talk a little mm-hmm. bit about about going out there and and observing, and that's kind of why Mac is here. Um, she uh, she's like you in a lot of ways, Cindy, in that she's decided in mid midlife that she wants to do something different. You know, um, you're. Mac was in uh, theater like I was back in the day. Um, and she's done educational writing, and now she's decided, well, I'm going to become a mat- master naturalist. And, um, and, and, and you're studying. Um, she went back to school. She's going to get her degree. In, what, what, what's it, what's it going to be in, Mac? Well, it, environmental studies. Okay. Is, so, is sort of the degree, but it has to have a different name because I'm old and weird. So it's called interdisciplinary <laughs> studies. <laughs> ah, I see. And and Cindy's the same way. You were a journalist. You've done other, you ran a bookstore yourself. Um, what is this called <laughs> to go out and, and explore nature? Uh, because what it means uh, to both of you is slogging uh, around in prairies and in marshy areas and, um, you know, yes. as, um, and, and hunting for odinates. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit. Searching for odinates. Um, searching, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, searching, sorry. Searching for odinates. I say stalking odinates. Um, uh, Mac, what's that like? It's, it's incre- an incredible amount of fun. It's really fun. Uh, and basically what, what you do is you're given a site if you're an odinate monitor, and you walk that site with a partner, um, at a steady pace, you aren't allowed to stop and watch because they, it's, it's all science um, and they want something steady and the same and replicable. And then you note all the different um, odinates, dragon and damselflies that you see. And so my site is Emily Oaks Nature Center. And um, it's a lovely nature center out in Skokie, very small with a lovely pond. And we walk through on a tiny path through the, you know, under, underbrush basically next to the pond. And I look for odinates and my partner follows behind me and marks them down. And half the, I'd say more than half the time, I can't tell which odinate it is because <laughs> They're really hard to identify, <laughs> but you, you, you look at nature differently when you're, uh, and, and that's one of the things about monitoring that I so love is that it makes me experience nature differently. You're going mm-hmm. from the very, very tiny um, out back and you're shifting your perspective constantly. The, exo- the, the, the walk can be exhausting, not because it's long, but because of the way you're paying attention. And I just, I love that. And I, and I love odinates. I think they're incredibly cool and sort of magical. And the word odinate is fun. And <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Cindy, as you point out in your book, Chasing Dragonflies, a uh, natural, cultural, and personal history, it's really hard to identify dragonflies mm-hmm. when they're, when they're, when they're buzzing around. Absolutely. And a a lot of people get started and, you know, want to become monitors. And then when they see what the learning curve is that first year, like it was, you know, for me that first year and second year, uh, they get a little discouraged. We have just under a hundred species of dragonflies here in Illinois and about just right around 50 damselfly species so really it's not that much birders will be like oh you know that's 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 easy but the females look different often than the males and uh the little you know teenage dragonflies and damselflies may look a little different than the adults so so it can actually be a little more than that plus they're fast right they're mac probably can attest to this you know you you see them zip by and you're like what was that so it's yeah. It takes a little while to get, um, and I have a chapter in the book that's all about this um, this thing where it takes a while to get your dragonfly eyes, your odinate mm-hmm. eyes on. And part of that is just learning to be quiet, learning to be patient, learning to pay attention. And you will be astonished at what you see. And not only do you see all these new creatures, all these new odinates, but you also see so many other things in the natural world. 
Yeah, yeah. Other, things yeah. You, you, you'll see by accident while just being quiet. And, yeah. you know, we live in a world where we're just terrified of silence. Um, you know, you walk into a restaurant, it's got to have the TV on or music blaring or a, a, mm -hmm. a store has got to have music in the piped in in the background. We just cannot deal with silence. And that's got to be a different frame of mind as well. When you're out there, uh, you're hearing different things. It's not it's not the music and it's not the craziness uh, you write in your book, by the way, um, uh, uh, Cindy, that uh, at this writing, there are an estimated 3,109 dragonfly species um, and 3,212 damselfly species known to us worldwide. That's just about 6,300 odes to keep track of. It's not a lot compared with insects like butterflies, which are thought to have about 20,000 species, even birds, which are estimated at just under 10,000 species worldwide, have those ode numbers beat. Um, but there are plenty of dragonfly and damselfly species to wrap our minds around, uh, exactly. especially, yeah, especially when it's it's hard to even tell what you're seeing uh, yeah. on any given day. How many in Illinois? Um, so just about a hundred dragonfly species and about fifty damselfly species. And here, where we are in the Chicago region. Um, you know, we get some of the northern species. This year I saw um, two species. Yeah, I've been monitoring for almost, oh gosh, um, since 2005. So what is that, like 18 years? But I saw um, two species I'd never seen before. And I think as climate change happens, as the world changes, we're going to be seeing, you know, those numbers fluctuate quite a bit. And it's important to remember birds have been really well studied butterflies have been really well studied but dragonflies not so much so just in one year i think it was 2016 17 i mean they found 80 new species in africa of uh, odin so i mean there's all these new species we don't even know about uh yeah as so you mentioned yeah as you mentioned uh if you just take into account islands around the world where probably these have not been identified at this point. Um, and, and, and why is that? Why, you know, given that uh, dragonfly, I've always thought uh, dragonflies are a sign of good luck. When I see a dragonfly, I think that's good luck. Um, but so, and, and given the, the cultural significance of dragonflies, as you alluded to earlier, why do you think they haven't been studied as much? You know, it's so interesting you mentioned good luck because that's certainly true in some parts of the world. They also have, there's a chapter about um, the cultural history of dragonflies right. and some good books too that have been written, um, you know, big volumes about cultural history of dragonflies. But those sharp looking abdomens, that's that tail that people call the tail. Um, it's not hard to see why some people are very afraid of dragonflies. They think they're going to get stung. Mm -hmm. um, they think the dragonflies mm -hmm. will sting you because they think it's a stinger. And the French call dragonflies the devil's agent. Um, the, in Romania, it's called the devil's riding horse. And my favorite, the Germans uh, say call uh, dragonflies the devil's bride. And my very favorite, the devil's grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> so the devil's grandmother. So, so there is, despite you know seeing them as good luck. Um, I know so many people I meet. Um, there is a chapter in the book called "The Girl with the Dragonfly Tattoo." So many people I meet have a dragonfly tattoo. Um, so there's that symbolism um, to a lot of people. Uh, usually, when they've lost someone, a loved one, they'll get a dragonfly tattoo and they'll tell me about dragonflies they see like at the same time every year. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, it's so interesting to me that they have that kind of connection with the dragonfly. Um, you know, whereas um, researchers have a different connection and, um, you know, Mac and I have a different connection going out and chasing them. But it's really interesting that people have all these different associations from dragonflies being the most beautiful good luck thing you could ever mm -hmm. want to see to, you know, oh, this is a connection with someone I lost to uh, 
ah, you know, the devil's grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> and they're also, I had no idea as that they were considered negative by anybody you know they've always seemed benign and beautiful to me yeah I, I i agree with you mac that has always been my observation is that dragonflies do not come at you they're they're going to just they might they might not run away um or, or they might you know um it, it, try to get a photograph of one and it's flitting yeah. around or especially a damselfly they, they don't sit still long enough uh, and uh, but so, but I've never feared dragonflies, uh, and, and it's interesting. Well, but I think I would like to get folks out of the mindset that insects are icky, okay? And yeah. that to you know, even butterflies to some people, I think, uh, are icky. Yeah. Um, but butterflies are the least icky of the insects. But to to a lot of people, anything other than a butterfly, it's like nah. I'm, I'm really not interested in this. And I think we need to have people like you, Cindy and Mac, on the show to convince people that th these are important insects. These are the linchpins. There, there's so much more insect mass on the planet than any other being. Um, we can't afford to be losing them. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, it's, it's hard to tell if there's that insect uh, uh, in insect again yeah insect again or whatever they're they're calling it um but it, it, there there are indications that we're losing uh biomass insect biomass and that's not a good thing the uh, new york times magazine had a great piece called uh, the insect apocalypse is here boy doesn't isn't that a downer for the holiday season sure it's, it's, don't worry we're, we'll, we'll Matt, we're not hearing you very well Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, now you're well, there. It's just, it, it, it was, I was thinking about this also when you were talking earlier about the Belleville Prairie and um, pollinators and, you know, the, the um, wonderful woman on the south side who does bees and things like that. And it, I think that it's something that's come up with Belleville Prairie and come up on this show a lot is we've got to start thinking in ecosystems rather than in species. Because yeah. uh, the ecosystem ecosystems are so complex, webs are so complex. We can't think of one. We can't have a favorite being in an ecosystem or in a web. They all need each other, and it's all more complicated than we realize. We're beginners at this study of the natural world, and I'm really a beginner. But even the scientists, and that's something that the naturalists over the centuries, that's the great naturalists have all said this. We, it's, it's complicated, it's interlinked. And so yeah. I think if we look at protecting ecosystems, yeah, you know, rather than a given species, if and, that and, just really captures my imagination. Yeah, and, and you look at the, again, referring to Belle Bowl Prairie, some people have said, well, well, we'll find the insects, we'll dig up the plants and we'll move them. Um, yeah. That is, I know you're you're wincing, Cindy, because it is so uh, anti-science. It 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 you it shows you do not understand what an ecosystem is. It's like taking a giraffe and putting it in a zoo in St. Louis and saying, "See, it's doing fine." That, that's uh, no, it might be alive, but it's not part of uh, an ecosystem. Um, it is something else altogether, and you, you don't get that back if once you destroy it uh which takes us to we've got like five minutes here um and one of the things cindy you want to talk about um is getting out into nature in the winter and and why that is important uh yeah and and um i'm sure mac you'll you'll be doing that because you're going to continue to do uh your observations um obviously you're not going to see odinates uh over the winter here uh, but Cindy, Without appreciating everything else, uh, Cindy, what uh, you wrote about that on your blog just the other week. Yeah. Um, you know, this is kind of the fourth season for a lot of people on the prairie where, um, you know, they don't get out and go for a walk because it's cold and, you know, maybe it's gray outside and, you know, seasonal, um, seasonal affective disorder, you know, you're like, oh, I just want to stay in uh, with my hot drink and a uh, couple under this afghan. But look at the colors out there on the tall grass prairie. 
oh, it looks different this year at, at this time of year than any other time of the year. And mm -hmm. the structures of the seed heads, like this wild bergamot, where you can really pay attention to the structure of a plant and there's not a lot of um you know flying critters out so you don't have all these distractions you can really focus on um, the architecture of the prairie and the way plants are formed. You can see the sky, the sky looks different in the winter, I think, than at any other time of the year. There's that blue kind of scoured look, you know, the way when it does snow, we haven't had any snow here yet to speak of it, the way the snow kind of casts all these blue shadows of the tall grass prairie plants and you you can use your imagination also when you see tracks like these squirrel tracks of who's out there there's all these clues and you can um there's a program i do for groups called um, winter prairie wonders we've been doing it a lot this month but i mean how fun is it to see these tracks and to learn you know which animals made them how wonderful is it to see the way ice forms on a compass plant leaf like in this photo here, and to really look at the compass plant stem. How beautiful to see the black capped chickadees all fluffed up and shivering to kind of stay warm and think about their winter habits. Uh, I love the chickadees, by the way. I just went out and refilled my bird feeders before the show, and it was like they were all waiting for me in the tree. It's like, come on, come on, you know. <laughs> Those prairie plants are, I mean, they're nurturing the seeds yeah. and uh, the rose hips from the prairie, all nurturing, mm -hmm. you know, a different, a kind of a different slice of life. And the queen bees, knowing they're under the ground, like your correspondent was just talking about, knowing you're there, it, it kind of taps into your imagination, the yeah. dragonflies and butterfly them. There's so much life going on, and, and so much of it is unseen. And, and um, just... Uh... Yeah. You, you learn about it just by being out there. I wanted to show a photo here um, before we go. Uh, I'm, and it makes me wonder if you're going to be doing this in uh, the winter, Mac. Uh, explain what we're looking at here. Yeah. Well, this is uh, the Wild Mile on the Chicago River. So this is right downtown, Kingsbury Avenue. Um, the uh, waste management um, is right on the other side where you begin to see that that you know um, metal wall and it's a it's a project to basically bring nature back to this incredibly dis industrial area on the Chicago River um, and it's a lot of science so they're testing the water they're counting birds and it's all citizen you know citizen scientists basically um, not putting it together, but doing a lot of the monitoring and picking up trash in kayaks. And um, and it's really quite lovely. So if this works, then it'll be, I think it's the biggest one, the first one um, mm -hmm. that's of this size, trying to look at how to re-nature an industrial river. Uh, uh, and and, and so, are, yeah. they gonna, are they gonna have you out there um, uh, in the winter? Um, we basically in the winter, people do bird counting and not much else. There's a couple of volunteers who do water monitoring. So they're checking the water um, through the course of the whole year. Um, but in winter, yeah, nobody nobody gets into kayaks because I think there's a concern that if you tip in, it'll <laughs> be too too dangerous. Yeah, because yeah, um, uh, and you pick up trash during the uh, the year in, 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 in addition to doing your observations there. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a bizarre thing to say perhaps, but it's an, an enormous amount of fun to go pick up trash on the Chicago river in a kayak. Um, <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do, you know, and being in the Chicago river on a kayak gives you again, it's like, it's like looking for dragon and damselflies. It gives you a different perspective. You're much quieter because you don't have the walking, you know, you're just so I can let the current take me and go up within feet of a night heron. And it's, it's, it's just too, so still I can, I've seen muskrats, I've seen herons, night herons, um, you know, the biggest, uh, 
the, the, the biggest blue. raccoon I've ever seen. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and these are photos that you've taken uh, while. Uh, uh, and where where was this taken? This was taken in Skokie Lagoons. Okay. Um, so this was a heron in Skokie Lagoons, and again, it was it was on a kayak, so I was able to just sort of drift and take various pictures on my iPhone. Yep. And I, cormorant. I, a cormorant. Yeah. So I'm not a birder. So my my description of my identification of birds is quite often it, it was brown and it was large. <laughs> you know? Uh, I'm learning. I'm at such the beginning of the, all of the learning curves here. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are we are flat out of time and all Oh, and one more thing, we have comments uh from Domenico and this is cool. I didn't know this. He says the jaws of the dragonfly nymph was the model for the mouth parts in Alien, the movie Alien. Really? How cool oh, is that? that is that is really cool. Yeah. That is really cool. Uh, so uh, thanks, Domenico. Uh, we need pop culture in here, too, as well. Um, well, you know what? I think we're going to do this again, and I think we need to do it again uh, with both of you. Um, this has just been so much fun. Uh, to talk, And we barely scratched the surface. And uh, Peggy's, yep, you, Peggy's got uh, chasing dragonflies up there. I'm going to hold uh, the tall grass prairie. Uh, I just bought both of those. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. I can't I'm wait to get them. They will make great gifts for your uh, uh, ecology-minded yep. friends for the holidays. So uh, yep. tall grass and conversation. I can't wait to take my great nephew out next summer and show him a dragonfly or a damselfly and explain that when it's a baby in the water and he can't see it, it's moving around by shooting water out his butt. <laughs> I'm going to turn into a naturalist just with that. I'm so excited. There we go. <laughs> was, was, was that imitating the nymph, Mike? Yeah, this is a nymph. This is my imitation. <laughs> that's what it's, that's the actual sound of the nymph uh, shooting water out of its butt. All right. Um, well, I just put the link up to order uh, Cindy's books off of cindycrosby.com.